extreme frontiers in geo-exploration. As I was considering this topic, I was reminded of Psalm 97. Clouds and darkness surround him. A fire goes before him. His lightnings like the world, the earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. The heavens declare his righteousness, and all the peoples see his glory. And all the peoples see his glory. It should be no surprise that out on the extreme frontiers of geo-exploration, we will witness and experience the glory of God. Maybe some of you can relate to my experiences growing up in a Christian home. I obediently went to church every Sunday. I could say the right religious words. I was president of my church youth group. But there was a disconnect between what I knew and what I believed. If I had been asked if I was a Christian, I would have said yes. If I had been asked, how do you know you are a Christian? I would have said, well, I go to church every Sunday. Uh, I am president of the church youth group. I take communion. To me, being a Christian was doing rather than believing. That shaky background was not strong enough to support me when I went to college in a small secular liberal arts school. It was during the late 1960s and a turbulent time on campus. The Vietnam War was at its peak. The draft was moving to a lottery system. Campus rebellion was ignoring established authorities, and I was in the middle of it all. Anxiety, fears, pride all confused me. I realized that I needed some kind of grounding for my life. So I enrolled in a New Testament Christian scriptures class taught by the college chaplain. In that course, the chaplain delighted in emphasizing apparent contradictions in scripture, that Bible stories were fabricated to validate the lifestyle of the early Christians, and that Christ really didn't rise from the dead. I believed all of this, so by the end of the semester course, I concluded that if there is a God, he can't communicate with people or with me. I settled into the role of an agnostic and sought stability and purpose elsewhere. I found it in the sciences. I already had a natural ability in these disciplines, so I poured my energies into them and also into the sport I loved, rock climbing. I went to graduate school at University of Colorado as a research assistant in the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research, a research institute centered around the geology and ecology of cold regions. Here, I could earn a graduate degree while receiving a salary and paid tuition for mountaineering, climbing, and skiing. It was an ideal arrangement for me, <clears throat> and I immersed myself in that lifestyle, preferring to ignore the Vietnam conflict and God. These were times of enjoyment of the extreme frontiers of geo-exploration. Daily, I was seeing God's glory around me. Can I have the next slide? But I did not recognize it as such. I marveled at the beauty of nature, and that was all. But looking back, I recognized times when God made some direct overtures to me, and both related to tragedies. On a warm, sunny March day in Boulder, Colorado, two university students climbed the third flat iron. Uh, next slide. This climb is long and technical, but rather easy. But a surprise snowstorm swept down from the mountains accompanied by rapidly dropping temperature. Next slide. As a member of the mountain rescue team, I was called out that evening to save these climbers. It was dark and snowing. Our headlamps were helped by a searchlight set up at the base of the cliff by the county sheriff. We knew that one climber had already fallen and we were trying to reach the other climber. Because of the snowstorm and the darkness, we could not see him. Our progress was slow because of the conditions. Then, with eerie silence, I saw his form tumble past me 
illumined for a split second in the searchlight beam and then disappearing into the darkness 500 feet below. I will never forget that image. A strong, active young man vanished into a black abyss forever. As we were down climbing, I was distracted by thoughts of God and eternity. But I managed to again immerse myself in my work and studies and push that incident back in my mind so that even today I rarely think about it. As I was nearing the completion of my graduate education, I was again called out at night on a rescue mission near Rocky Mountain National Park. It was a warm summer evening in Boulder, but when I arrived at my assigned location, I learned that more than 12 inches of rain had fallen in three hours over the watershed of the Big Thompson River. A river normally two feet deep suddenly changed to a wall of water 19 feet deep. I was stationed at the top of a ridge with radio gear to relay radio messages from rescuers in the canyon to the sheriff's staff coordinating the rescue. I saw none of it, but I heard all of it. Roads and houses had been washed away. Many people were stranded and perched on the sides of the canyon, and 145 people died. It was the worst natural disaster in Colorado history. I remember thinking, how could a brief thunderstorm cause so much destruction? And again, my thoughts turned to God. But I certainly did not come to the conclusion that David reached in Psalm 29, an account of a large storm. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness and strips the forest bare. What would you think if you witnessed that much destruction? The psalmist continues, and in his temple, all cry glory. I was definitely not in the spiritual state of mind that would lead me to proclaim glory. But I certainly did consider God and how quickly the landscape can change and our lives end. Upon completion of my graduate studies, I moved with my wife to Cornell University on a postdoctoral research appointment. There I met an old friend of mine from college who invited us to his church. It was a Bible church and encouraged and, and um, <clears throat> And I wasn't so sure about attending a Bible church, but my wife encouraged me to attend. I had an image of what a Bible church would be like and decided beforehand that I would go once, but only once. However, I was surprised from the very beginning what this church, Faith Bible Church, was like. The pastor was an engineer and a full-time employee at the Cornell University Space Center during the era when Carl Sagan was advocating um, space exploration there. Many in the congregation were young scientists, usually graduate students or postdocs. In that small church, there were geophysicists, biophysicists, electrical engineers, biochemists, geneticists, agriculturalists, mathematicians, nuclear engineers, astrophysicists, and computer scientists. This was not what I was expecting. I decided to return the next week and soon became a regular at church. We had many discussions after church and in Friendly's Ice Cream Parlor in Ithaca, New York, covering wide-ranging topics often related to science and Christianity. One thing was obvious to me. These new friends approached interpretation of the Bible with the same effort, the same exacting methods and precision which made them highly successful in their scientific research. Similar to their scientific data, the biblical data were not to be ignored nor changed to fit preconceived ideas. There was a coherent interpretation of the data, and that interpretation pointed towards a true and living God who could communicate reliably and cared about a relationship with me. After about three months, I came to the belief that the Bible is true. 
And then I had to wrestle with the idea that if the Bible is true, then I must believe what it says about me and my fallen state. At that point, on a January Sunday, I bowed my head to the Lord and gratefully accepted the blood of the Lord Jesus to cover my sins. My scientific work did not change. My methods did not change. My interpretations did not change. But my appreciation of what I was researching greatly increased. To give you some idea of what I mean, <clears throat> suppose you read a great novel in high school. It was so good and meant so much to you, you periodically read it again through college. And it even became the subject of your thesis in graduate school. Then one day, you actually met the author. And the author took an interest in you and encouraged you in your studies, and even wanted to continue that relationship with you. When you read that novel again, how would your appreciation change? The marvelous things I had seen and was studying became more amazing. If you know the creator, the creation is even more remarkable. I had been studying the book of nature and marveling at that, but now I actually knew the author. Psalm 19 progresses from natural revelation, the heavens declare the glory of God, to special revelation, the law of the Lord is perfect, and concludes with a personal application, cleanse me from secret faults. My journey to the Lord followed a similar progression. Although it took longer than it should have, it was clear how effectively God worked with me as an established member of the scientific community to bring me to a true appreciation of his glory. And looking back, I can see that God responded with something like, now you can really appreciate my creation from a proper perspective. Well, you haven't seen anything yet. Hang on. My extreme frontiers of geo-exploration were about to be stretched. First, I was asked to help teach a graduate course on ice in the solar system at the Cornell University Space Center. The Voyager space probes um, can we have the next slide? The Voyager space probes, which were launched two years earlier, were about to arrive at Jupiter and for the first time give close-up images of the moons of Jupiter. Spectrometry indicated that some of those moons had considerable water content and were likely composed of ice. So our class goal was to imagine before the arrival of the space probes what an ice world would be like. What would Voyager see? Ice volcanoes spewing out molten ice? Ice mountains? Deep crevasse canyons? Ice plate tectonics? What would meteorite craters look like? Before the semester ended, the entire class, except me, went to Houston to see the images as they were being received. Perhaps a third of our ideas were observed on Callisto, Ganymede, and Europa. By the way, Voyager is still functioning after 30 years of space travel. It sent back close-up views of Saturn, uh, Uranus, and Neptune. At the very edge of the solar system, Voyager 1 took one last picture of Earth from 4 billion miles away. Voyager is now 10 billion miles away and still sending information back. My adventures with God were just beginning. The reason I did not go to Houston with the rest of the class was because my main research involved developing a computer model of the whole Earth, predicting past sea level and ice sheet changes. To verify predictions of the global model, I went on a field trip measuring sea level change evident along 1,000 miles of Brazilian coastline. <clears throat> From Sao Paulo to the mouth of the Amazon River. Not long after returning from tropical Brazil, I was invited to join a British expedition to Spitsbergen Island in the high Arctic, only 500 miles from the North Pole. After after a two-week trip on a Norwegian trawler from Scotland to Spitsbergen, 
I spent the rest of the summer isolated in a beautiful Arctic fjord. That summer, I still consider, next slide. That summer I still consider as one of the highlights of my scientific career. It was even more special because I could appreciate God's hand in all that I was seeing. The OPEC oil embargo of 1979 created a national energy crisis that brought me employment at Sandia National Labs to study natural gas and low permeability sandstones. This was my first exposure to oil well drilling. The uh, rocks retrieved in cores, next slide, from two miles deep <clears throat> could be compared to those rocks composed nearby, tilted and uplifted more than three miles vertically. Interpretations of these rocks revealed a very different world than the one currently at the well site in northwest Colorado. Preserved in the rocks were ancient deposits of large rivers, shallow inland seas, and beaches. For the first time, I actually applied my geology to a topic of energy resources, undertaking experiments in the field and also in the lab. Well, too much traveling, important new responsibilities at home with the arrival of my first child, and God's call to Christian education landed me at Calvin College, close to the Great Lakes. So my scientific interests turned to studies of the changing levels of the Great Lakes during the last stages of the Ice Age. Some of this research involves studying the sediments below Lake Michigan using geophysical echo soundings. These methods uh, were used in association with coring of lake sediments and associated bogs. And these sediments were pollen grains, next slide, representing vegetation of plants now found only in northern Canada. We were reconstructing the Great Lakes history as ice age ice sheets were melting and the Perry Mastodon with his friends were ruling the region. <laughs> what was an ice age earth like? In what ways did it differ from the present? Upon coming to Wheaton, I again used satellite information, but this time, instead of looking outward at planets and moons, the Topex Poseidon satellite used radar to measure the height of the global ocean. My NASA grant was to study sea level changes globally, and we could assemble a snapshot of the height of the entire ocean every 10 days. Results indicated that sea level is gradually rising with implications regarding global warming. Let me recap. God allowed me to see his glory reflected in many places and with many different tools. From satellites to deep drilling, from equatorial jungles to the high Arctic glaciers, from the cold ice age to the balmy present, from high mountains to sediments under the Great Lakes, with sonar and drilling and computers and satellites, I could witness his glory revealed in a myriad of ways and at all scales. The psalmist says, and all the peoples see his glory. The more I studied his creation and learned of the intricacies and majesty of this world, the more I appreciated God's glory, and the brighter the creation reflected that glory. Once I recognized the author of creation, what did I do about it? God's creation is, is a reflection of his glory, but we are also a similar reflection of his glory. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, and we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We are touched by his glory. We are transformed by his glory. And in our own small way, we reflect the glory of Christ. We are meant to radiate a glimmer of that glory to the people around us. A few years after the Soviet Union dissolved, I took my family to Moscow as volunteers in an orphanage and to distribute Bibles. This was a sabbatical year from teaching and also from geology. 
But a friend asked me to preach one Sunday at a small Russian Baptist church. This church was from the underground church of the Soviet era. What could I say? What would you tell men and women who had suffered greatly for their faith? Some in the congregation had been in prison because of their testimony for Christ. Others had husbands or relatives who had suffered some unto death under the religious persecution, and yet their faith remained strong. I felt just as inadequate then as I do now before you. I was just a wimpy American Christian. What would you tell them? Finally, I decided the topic of my message would be metamorphic rocks. <laughs> clay is actually composed of many microscopic clay mineral crystals, which not even a light microscope can see. But under pressure, the clay minerals are not crushed or made smaller. Rather, they grow larger. The minerals change into new larger biotite grains forming slate found on the roofs of most of our Wheaton buildings. With even more pressure, the minerals become even larger, and some are transformed into garnets, semi-precious gems. I explained to the congregation that this geological process illustrates how pressure and suffering can be used to refine, purify, and mold a person into a more beautiful soul. I will never forget what I saw when I looked at the congregation. It seemed like the whole congregation was sparkling. The babushka's eyes were gleaming bright with tears recalling past suffering. What makes a gem so attractive? It's the reflection. And these dear women and men were reflecting God's glory through the suffering they had endured. The metamorphic rock story does not end there, however. With even more pressure applied, a new mineral forms called starlight. The name is from two Greek words meaning stone cross. The twinned variety forms deep under high mountains in the shape of a cross, a reminder of Christ's ultimate suffering for us all. Almost all of my geological studies have involved water in its various forms, salty, fresh, and frozen, either on Earth or elsewhere in the solar system. A very important source of drinkable water is underground and not very available for 25 percent of the world's population, who daily have less water than the UN claims is necessary for sustained health. The quest to provide others with life-giving, pure water and also pure spiritual water has brought me to the most recent frontier in geo-exploration. And this has, in many ways, been the most rewarding of my career. I have gone to Tan Tanzania, Chad, Nigeria, Honduras, Haiti, and Russia. It seems like everywhere pure water is needed, both physical water of life and spiritual water of life. I have found that I was always welcome if I could help get water. As an example, I was asked by the indigenous church, Evangelical Church of Chad, to help provide water for small Muslim villages near the United Nations Sudanese refugee camps. Before going into the villages, protocol required that I get permission from the local sheikh. We went to the small provincial headquarters and sat cross-legged in a circle on a carpet that covered the dirt floor. The sheikh said that when the refugees started to arrive, his Muslim brothers did not help. But you Christians, speaking of the Evangelical Church in Chad, came first. And long after the UN leaves, you will still be here. You are Christians, and we are Muslims, but you are always welcome in my province. Because it often is difficult to find water underground, my friend Rick Page and I have been inventing inexpensive geophysical instruments and training indigenous Christian well drillers to use the equipment and to proclaim Christ. It has been a task that is both intellectually challenging and rewarding. It has provided avenue for ministering with both natural revelation as well as special 
revelation. So in my life <clears throat> as a geologist, the extreme frontiers of geo-exploration have taken me from the far north to tropical South America, from the Sahara Desert to cold mountaintops, from the bottom of the Great Lakes and sediments two miles deep to satellite sea level measurements, from analysis of mantle properties deep in the Earth's interior to satellite exploration of the Jupiter system, and from the tiniest of clay particles to the huge ice sheets that once covered half of Europe and North America. God has created a world with incredible complexity and amazing harmony, spectacular beauty and awesome fury. There are predictable cycles, but with random and interesting twists. God's creation is a novel written by the finest author imaginable. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the world around us, the world around you, is loudly declaring God's glory. Can you hear it? Can you see it? Can you reflect it?